Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Operation Cyclone, Operation Timber Sycamore, two of the most expensive and consequential CIA covert operations in the agency's history. You may not have heard of them, but you've definitely heard of the two conflicts that they sought to influence. The Soviet Union is reported to have made major foreign deployment of uh, some of its military forces. The Soviet Union is going to have to speak to its motives in taking such a step. The effect of their actions, however, which I can speak to, is to increase their intervention in the internal affairs of Afghanistan. There was a coup d'etat in Afghanistan today. A communist leader favorable to Moscow was deposed by another communist leader even more favorable to Moscow. There was street fighting in the capital city, Kabul. Tonight, there is a curfew. And some of the thousands of Soviet troops who had been pouring into Afghanistan this week helped overthrow the government. In 1979, the Soviets had invaded and overthrown the government of Afghanistan. And when it was time for his State of the Union address the following month, the then-President Jimmy Carter made it publicly known that the U.S. was going to get involved. We superpowers also have the responsibility to exercise restraint in the use of our great military force. The integrity and the independence of weaker nations must not be threatened. They must know that in our presence, they are secure. Meeting this challenge will take national will, diplomatic and political wisdom, economic sacrifice, and of course, military capability. American involvement had actually started months before that. The CIA's Operation Cyclone had been arming and financing the Afghan Mujahideen fighters who were trying to eject the Russians from their country. And once Ronald Reagan was in office in 1981, funding for the CIA operation increased, along with the quality and the capabilities of the weapons being sent to the Mujahideen. By 1987, the U.S. was providing $630 million a year to the insurgency, including giving them anti-aircraft stinger missiles, something the CIA didn't want to do initially. As I mentioned, it became the most expensive operation ever mounted by the CIA at the time. And according to reports, the program backed more radical, ideologically driven militant groups that were connected with Pakistan under the military regime of Zia ul Haq. You could say that, at least through one lens, it was a successful proxy war. The Soviets lost 15,000 troops and had to withdraw in 1989. But there was an incredibly high cost for fueling that war by backing an insurgency the way we did. Various estimates say between 500,000 and upwards of a million civilians were killed in Afghanistan in the 1980s. One estimate, based on a survey conducted in 1987, found 9% of the country's population died, while millions were displaced or became refugees. That's to say nothing of the other consequence, which Condoleezza Rice, of all people, pointed out in 2009. She said, quote, after we had helped the Afghans overthrow Soviet power at the end of the 1980s, when we left Afghanistan and abandoned Pakistan, that territory became the very territory where al-Qaeda trained and attacked us on September the 11th. Oops. And then there was Operation Timber Sycamore. After two years of a civil war in Syria, during which the regime of Bashar al-Assad began a brutal onslaught against his own people, President Obama said this in a primetime address to the American nation. After careful deliberation, I determined that it is in the national security interests of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons through a targeted military strike. And the day after any military action, we would redouble our efforts to achieve a political solution that strengthens those who reject the forces of tyranny and extremism. Those strikes took more than a year to be authorized, and Obama has been heavily criticized in the years since for not intervening in Syria, for doing nothing, which is nonsense. Syria was a proxy war, and we were involved in it. In fact, Obama tasked the CIA back in 2013 to arm rebels in Syria, the most extensive effort since Afghanistan. According to documents The Washington Post obtained from Edward Snowden, the CIA's Syria-related operations accounted for about $1 of every $15 in the CIA's overall budget. The New York Times reported that some officials were worried that U.S. weapons going into Syria could get into the hands of dangerous militant groups. Sound familiar? But apparently the Saudis, Jordanians, 
Israelis, they all lobbied Obama to play a more active role in this burgeoning proxy war. And what happened? Well, a flood of weapons made their way into black markets and into the hands of not just dodgy groups that we knew were operating in Syria, but straight into the hands of ISIS too, arms and ammunition from at least 25 different countries. Not only did our role in that war not lead to the kind of political solution that Obama publicly said he wanted, but various estimates say that upwards of 200,000 Syrian civilians were killed in that conflict. The vast, vast majority by Assad's forces, but also many at the hands of ISIS and other militant rebel groups, some of whom we helped arm. Today, Assad is still in office. And not only is he still in power, he's being normalized again. Just last week, he was being hosted by our ally, the Crown Prince of the UAE, one of the countries that was supporting the rebels against him. So two examples of proxy wars that we were involved in, one against illegal invaders, one a brutal civil war, one a kind of success story, and the other a total failure. But here's the thing about proxy wars. They tend to drag on. They tend to be harder to resolve diplomatically, and they tend to result in massive civilian casualties, whether in the end they're a success or a failure. Why is this important to recognize right now? Because it seems Russia's war in Ukraine might be heading in that direction. Last week, New York Times correspondent David Sanger reported that there is a tenuous balance the Biden administration has tried to maintain as it seeks to help Ukraine lock Russia in a quagmire. A quagmire. This week, right-wing academic Neil Ferguson, and I wouldn't normally quote Neil Ferguson, he's not someone I usually agree with on anything, but he happens to be a very well-connected individual in both Washington and London. He wrote in Bloomberg that he thinks the U.S. intends to keep the war going, and he quotes a senior unnamed Biden administration official saying, quote, the only end game now is the end of the Putin regime. And the same goes for the British, he says. Ferguson refers to senior UK officials and says there is a belief that, quote, the UK's number one option is for the conflict to be extended and thereby bleed Putin. Extend the conflict. Bleed your enemy. This isn't from a new playbook. At the start of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the US had also reportedly talked with other countries about making it as expensive as possible for the Soviets to continue their efforts. As my colleague Eamon Moyuddin said to me on this show on MSNBC on Sunday, what is our aim here? What should it be? Are we trying to protect Ukraine or defeat Russia? Because those aren't necessarily the same things. For a lot of people, they are the same thing. But the only options on the table aren't Ukraine defeats Russia and Vladimir Putin is toppled, or Kyiv falls and we then back a Ukrainian insurgency against Russian occupiers. Bleeding Putin and Moscow will come at the cost of Ukrainian civilians. There's no doubt about that. We have a pretty awful record, too, when it comes to proxy wars, even the ones we win. So maybe, just maybe, we could focus a bit more on a diplomatic solution to the conflict and a little less on planning for a long, drawn-out insurgency. And look, there is no doubt that Ukraine has been treated horrifically by Russian invaders to a kind of brutality and inhumanity that no people or sovereign nation should have to endure. And they have every right to want the West to give them arms and support. They may want to fight an insurgency and not compromise, not do a deal. And they have that right. Of course they do. But the rest of us have to learn some lessons from history. We have to be fully aware of both the pros and the cons of flooding a conflict zone with weapons. Right now, President Biden has just arrived in Europe, hoping to discuss this difficult and precarious situation with America's allies, including the most important question of all, how does the West best help Ukraine? And how does it help save Ukrainian lives? Perhaps the awkward truth is that the answer may not be the same for both those questions. Joining me now is Ivo Dalda, who was U.S. ambassador to NATO under President Obama. He's now president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And Anatole Levin, a former foreign correspondent who covered Afghanistan in the late 1980s for the Times of London. He's now senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and author of Ukraine and Russia, a Fraternal Rivalry. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Anatole, let me start with you. You spent a lot of time covering Afghanistan. Uh, the Mujahideen, uh, the Russian occupation. You've obviously seen what's happened since in Syria. Are you worried about what I laid out a moment ago, the thought of a long drawn out insurgency, a proxy war in Ukraine? 
Well, yes, I'm, I'm extremely worried because it's quite clear that there are elements in both Washington and London uh, who do want to use this as Afghanistan was used uh, in order to uh, weaken Russia, eventually bring down or try to bring down um, the, the regime of, of Putin, uh, really with no regard whatsoever uh, for the number of Ukrainian lives, like Afghan lives, uh, in the past um, that were thrown away. Uh, in the course of this struggle. Uh, and the other uh, two things I think to recognize are, one, um, that, uh, as you've suggested, uh, it's often very difficult to control your own proxies on, on the ground. We saw that, as you said, in Afghanistan in the 80s, where America empowered the most radical mujahideen, partly because they were the best fighters uh, against the, the Soviets. Uh, in Syria, where American support ended up in the hands of uh, al-Nusra, linked to al-Qaeda. Uh, and in Ukraine, there is uh, always the risk that the, the best fighters in this conflict will be the Ukrainian extreme nationalists, uh, who, after the war, could actually pose an obstacle to the westernization of Ukraine. But finally, uh, as you have suggested, uh, the, the thing is that if um, the Russian regime was now definitely aiming at the conquest of the whole of Ukraine and its subjugation, then it would undoubtedly be necessary simply to, to back the opposition to that. But um, the indications from both sides are that you, uh, the Ukrainian and Russian governments are trying to work towards a peace settlement. Now, it seems to me, therefore, that the duty of the United States is to support that peace settlement, while, of course, at the same time, uh, making sure uh, that it safeguards Ukrainian sovereignty and independence. Eva, I want to play you some sound from a former Obama Secretary of State earlier this month uh, on the Afghanistan parallels for Ukraine. Have a listen to Hillary Clinton. A very motivated and then uh, funded and armed uh, insurgency uh, basically drove the Russians out of Afghanistan. Um, obviously, the similarities are, are not uh, ones that you should uh, bank on, because uh, the terrain, the development uh, in urban areas, et cetera, is so different. But I think that is the model that people are now uh, looking toward. Eva, we wish Secretary Clinton all the best as she recovers from COVID right now. Uh, but if being bled dry in a long Afghanistan-style insurgent campaign is what the war in Ukraine is where it seems to be headed, then don't we have to look at everything that followed in the case of Afghanistan? Don't we have to be careful about these analogies? Yeah, let's start being careful about the analogies from the very beginning, because this isn't Afghanistan and this isn't Syria. This is a country that is being attacked by its neighbor without any provocation, without having posed any threat to the neighbor. And it's a country that is fighting for its own defense. That's the situation we're facing here. This is not a proxy war. This is not something the United States started uh, or is even fanning. This is a war because Vladimir Putin decided to invade Russia. Uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, Ukraine is trying to defend itself. And it is really remarkable that we are thinking that this is happening uh, because the United States is providing Ukraine with the means of self-defense. And it's only providing the Ukraine the means of self-defense because it has decided not to come to the aid of Ukraine directly. And if it were to do so, this war could be ended very, very quickly. It could also escalate, I recognize, very, very quickly, which is one of the reasons why uh, we haven't done this. But I, I, I find the analogy that this is a proxy war or somehow, is, uh, uh, as Neil Ferguson uh, uh, said in the Bloomberg piece, and, and uh, Anatole even repeated, that it is the, uh, you, the people in the UK and in, in the US who are fanning this war, it's not being fanned. It's being fanned by one side, uh, and the other side is trying to defend itself. And surely the, uh, the Ukrainians have a right to ask for anti-tank weapons or uh, uh, Stinger missiles in order to shoot down uh, aircraft that are bombing their cities or taking out tanks and artillery and multi-launch uh, multi, uh, rocket systems that are uh, shooting at, uh, at apartment buildings, at hospitals. 
uh, at theaters that, in which children are being uh, uh, being hidden from the bombing, uh, uh, and uh, and that's what we're really talking about. The idea that we are trying to prolong a war is ridiculous. It's Vladimir Putin who's prolong prolonging the war. This could be over tomorrow if he just pulled his forces back. Okay. Anadol, deal with that point from Evo that at the end of the day, no matter what long term consequences there may be from sending arms into Ukraine, ultimately, we are supporting a sovereign government defend itself from an illegal invasion. And the Ukrainians have agency here, too. They want to fight. They don't want to sign a deal where they have to give away part of their territory. And therefore, as long as they want to fight, they should be able to count on outside support. Well, first of all, um, if we are giving major support, as we are, uh, and are running certain physical risks, but above all, running very severe economic risks uh, for ourselves and the world, that gives us the right to a say um, in the uh, political process and a peace settlement in Ukraine. Secondly, uh, <laughs> you be very careful about talking about what the Ukrainians want. Uh, in every war I've covered, there has been a very considerable difference between uh, the politicians uh, at the top uh, and ordinary people's view of this. Um, I am convinced, on the basis of my travels in, in Ukraine, that uh, the majority of Ukrainians, certainly the vast majority, uh, want the Russian army to leave, want an end to this war. Uh, but whether they uh, would uh, reject a treaty of neutrality and whether they would continue to fight indefinitely for the return of territories to Ukraine, which Ukraine has in practice lost since 2014, nobody has the right to say that for sure, because we just don't know. As for the point about um, some, not everybody, by any manner of means, there are, of course, genuinely idealistic reasons to support Ukraine. But the point uh, about um, leading people uh, in the West uh, wanting to use this war uh, in order to bleed uh, Russia and bring down Putin, that is on the record. You've just quoted them. OK, Evo, do you want to deal with that point? You're right. Vladimir Putin is responsible for this war. Vladimir Putin is, is responsible for prolonging it by not ending the war he started. That's not mutually exclusive from saying that there are hawkish people in the West who would like to see this conflict as a way of getting rid of Vladimir Putin. There are people who have spoken on the record, not you per se, but others who have said this only ends with the fall of Putin. Yeah, I actually, I'm one of the people who think that this conflict is, this larger conflict is going to end only when Vladimir Putin is gone, because he is the cause of it. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so you but don't I don't believe think, the war in Ukraine but, can end until Vladimir Putin is gone, just to be no, clear. No, no, no. I, I said the larger war. I think the war in Ukraine okay. can end without uh, Vladimir Putin uh, being in power. But we are now in a very different state of a relationship with, with Russia uh, than we than we uh, were before. Uh, I mean, there are people who say we should go to war against China, too. It doesn't mean that that's the official policy of the United States government. There may even be people in the U.S. government who believes that. Uh, on the question of, of, of supporting the peace process, process. Uh, you know, Ukraine uh, and, and Russia uh, need to continue to have these conversations. But let's be very clear uh, that any idea that we're very close or, in, or even uh, close to a peace process uh, actually working out is, is also not true. And we're hearing that not only from Ukrainians, we're also hearing that from the Russians. The idea that neutrality uh, is something easily agreed to, yes, it is true that uh, something that Ukraine can agree to, but Ukraine is also insisting on security guarantees, real security guarantees, yes. not the ones that they got in 1994 as part of the Budapest Agreement. Those yes. security guarantees means that the United States needs to be willing to go to war to defend Ukraine against a possible uh, reinvasion by uh, by Russia. That's not done overnight. That's a major military and security commitment uh, that is necessary for the Ukrainians to accept neutrality. So this is complicated. It, it is complicated, and those are fair points. Before we run out of time, Evo, I do want to ask you one more question. Madeleine Albright passed away today at the age of 84, a massive figure on the global stage of the first woman secretary of state, someone who will be remembered fondly in places like Kosovo, where she pushed NATO into intervening against Milosevic in 1999, and maybe not so fondly in parts of the Middle East, where she famously said half a million dead Iraqi kids from U.S. sanctions was a price worth paying to get rid of Saddam, a remark she later regretted and disowned in her memoir. Towards the end of her life, she was calling out fascism, standing with refugees. She was a former refugee herself. Diplomat to diplomat, how will you remember her? 
Well, I think Madeleine Albright represented everything that is uh, great about the uh, about this country. As she mentioned, she was a refugee and immigrant to the country, and a country of immigrants. And Anatole is one. I'm one. Uh, you're one. We're all part of the of this, and she was uh, part of that too. But also someone who who embodied the true values of the country: democracy, uh, the rule of law. Uh, the importance of human rights. Uh, she made that part of her diplomacy, of her post-diplomatic life, uh, in protecting people who didn't have de democracy, who suffered uh, human rights abuses uh, uh, for a lifelong commitment. That is what America stands for, and I can't think of anyone better who, uh, than uh, Madeleine Albright embodying that, and, and she will be missed, uh, uh, not by the likes of Slobodan Milosevic or Vladimir Putin or Saddam Hussein, but certainly by the people like us who should care about uh, democracy and stability in the world. Can I just add Evo something? Dalda and Anatole, leave, leave very briefly, Anatole, briefly, we're out of time. She will not be remembered that way by many people in the Middle East. We will have to leave it there. Thank you both. Anatole Levin, Ivo Dalda, appreciate you coming on. Still to come, Democrat Patrick Leahy has been in the Senate long enough to see 15 Supreme Court nominees pass through. So it was quite something when he made this observation today about his Republican colleagues. I have never seen a committee a hearing where people have so ignored the ideas of basic decency. We'll unpack an ugly day of questioning for Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson after the break. But first, MSNBC's Richard Engel takes, us a, takes a closer look at how Ukraine's military is holding up against Russian forces around the capital. This is Kyiv, right here in the center. And these Russian areas, all, these red areas, are all Russian-controlled territory. So you see, just to the north of Kiev, there's a big Russian area, and to the northeast, there's another Russian area. But what's interesting about this map is all of these blue spots, and there's quite a few of them. These are all areas that have been captured by Ukrainian forces, recaptured from Russian territory or from Russian troops just over the last 48 hours, with many of them, particularly here uh, in, in this sector, over the last 24 hours. And this, they say, is the biggest counteroffensive that they've seen since the start of the war, the most blue that they've ever had on this map. And they're finding it very encouraging. The last day of questioning in Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's historic confirmation hearing should have been a serious affair. Jackson certainly held up her part of the deal, trying to set the tone early on by acknowledging the historic nature of this occasion. I do consider myself, having been born in 1970, to be the first generation to benefit from the civil rights movement, from the legacy of all of the work of so many people that went into changing the laws in this country so that people like me could have an opportunity to be sitting here before you today. But Republicans on the Judiciary Committee were far less composed. Senator Lindsey Graham spoke for nearly 10 minutes over his allotted time, badgering and interrupting a visibly exasperated Jackson. So the Would you baseline, now agree with me that computers... This crime is among the most difficult... No, answer most, my question. Any of these wait, defendants... Wait, wait a minute, Judge. You think it is a bigger deterrent... No, Senator, I didn't say versus... That's exactly what you said. ...substantial periods of supervision once the person... So if I could, may ask you... ...the purposes of punishment. And one of and them the, is an enhanced punishment by using a computer. They've either received or distributed well, that are... Well, that you don't, we don't know if they looked at them, but... 30, 40, 50 years in prison... Good. Cut. Good. I understand, Absolutely Senator, good. I hope you are. To do good. Is... Allow her to finish, please. <laughs> and when he wasn't interrupting Jackson, Graham wasted time complaining about Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings from nearly four years ago. The meetings they had... With Judge Kavanaugh, it was literally ambushed. He was ambushed. How would you feel if we did that to you? Senator, I've appreciated the kindness that each of you has shown me to see me in your offices, to talk with me about 
but, my approach. But, but my question is, Senator Sheese had nothing to do with the cause. No, but Kevin I'm Oikenary. asking her about you won't, you won't even how, how she response. may feel about what y'all did. Kavanaugh was confirmed, Republicans. You won that battle. How can you still be so aggrieved over this? When you win, you all complain. And when you lose, some of you incite a violent insurrection. The longest serving member of the Senate, Patrick Leahy, called Graham out by name, saying his behavior was beyond the pale. I've been on this committee longer than anybody else. I voted for more uh, nominees than anybody else. I think I voted for more Republican nominees than any, just about anybody on the committee. And I have never seen a committee uh, hearing where people have so ignored the ideas of basic decency in the way they question. Not to be outdone by Lindsey Graham, Senator Ted Cruz threw a tantrum of his own. I've asked her why she sentenced Stewart. You've gone over the time, Senator, by two minutes. Why she and a half. because you've interrupted me for two minutes, Mr. Chairman. Will you allow her to answer the question, or do you not want the American people to hear <laughs> why, with someone she described as uh, well, an egregious? You know, there comes a point, Senator, where you get a little bit. Chairman Durbin, hand. will you allow her to answer the question? You won't allow her to answer. I, the I, I will happily allow her to. The question is Senator why you thank you, sentenced Chairman. Stewart, an egregious child pornography possessor, so, to, to half of the amount. Please, sir. Calm down, Senator Cruz. Sounds like you've had too much caffeine. Maybe double fisting Dr. Pepper isn't such a good idea after all. Not only was he rude, Cruz was ill prepared trying to bash Judge Jackson over her case record, only to realize he was reading from the wrong file. I want to clarify for the record, by the way, the case I was discussing was Cooper and not Chazen. Uh, but Chazen is. Uh, the case that I was reading from your transcript was Cooper, but Chazen, all right, let's get to Chazen. I pulled the wrong tab. Once Cruz got his papers in order, he managed to rehash the same talking points that accused Judge Jackson of being soft on crime, as did almost all the Republicans who spoke today. Again, they were obsessed with child pornography offenses. Again, they were obsessed with her sentencing decisions on those cases. She gave this measured response to them. In every case... I am balancing the factors that Congress has determined are appropriate and required for a judge to make a determination. The data points that Senator Cruz pointed to that you may have in front of you don't account for all of the information that was before me as a judge and the authority that you all Congress and your prior confirmation when I was a district judge provided for me to exercise my judgment. And I treated those cases and every case very seriously and imposed a sentence that was sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. Judge, In you gave him area, three months. My question is, do you regret it or not? Senator, what I regret is that in a hearing about my qualifications to be a justice on the Supreme Court, we've spent a lot of time focusing on this small subset of my sentences. That is composure and dignity, and more than I can say for some of the Republican senators today. We have our legal experts standing by to discuss today's hearing with me and where Judge Jackson's confirmation will go from here. Stay tuned for that. And as we go to break, let's hear from a fired up Senator Cory Booker, also on the Judiciary Committee, responding to the Republican talking point on Judge Jackson's criminal sentencing record. This is a new, new low. And what's especially surprising about this is it didn't happen last year. You were put on a court that I'm told is the considered like the second most powerful court in our land. And you were passed with bipartisan support. Nobody brought it up then. Did they not do their homework? Were they lax? Did they make a mistake? I wonder, as they ask you the question, do you regret? I wonder if they regret that, that they didn't bring that out. No, why? Because it was an allegation that is meritless to the point 
of demagoguery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono. Uh, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono's turn. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you, Mr. I'm, Chairman. I'm, I'm asking you to be recognized to make, make a point to the Chairman. No, uh, Mr. Chairman. I believe he uh, recognized me. May I proceed? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I waited my turn on here, and I've been on this committee for 47 years. I, I think we ought to follow the regular order. Ridiculous behavior there. Let's bring in Lisa Kylar Barrett, Director of Policy at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Mark Joseph Stern is also here. He's a senior writer for Slate, covering courts and the law. And we have Ellie Mistal, too, justice correspondent for The Nation and author of the new bestseller, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. Thank you all for joining me on another historic day. Uh, Lisa, let's start with you. Today we saw Republicans going over time, interrupting Judge Jackson, badgering her. What do you have to say about the behavior we saw in that hearing? Um, I thought the behavior was just really incredible. And Betty, thank you for, for having us on and to discuss this. Um, just really totally unacceptable, incredibly hostile, um, rudely talking over her, being extremely condescending to this accomplished, um, clearly well-qualified judge and um, just really should not be tolerated by anyone, but certainly not by a, an elected official or a person elected to serve in the U.S. Senate. Ellie, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. It was it was shameful. It was disgusting. It was uh, uh, it was entirely predictable. And at some <laughs> point, I'm going to need Democrats to predict it and get in there and get into the fight, right? Like Dick Durbin at one point said, at some point, Ted, you're going to have to follow the rules. When? When is the point? When is the day that Ted Cruz will be forced to follow the rules? I will set my calendar by it and come watch with popcorn if that day ever comes. But until then, I need Democrats to get in there and not let them go over their time, not let them just shout these, these obscenities at this woman. Remember how this all starts. If we go back to 2018, the Republicans are getting hammered. Christine Blasey Ford has made a great opening statement. She is believable. She is credible. Republicans leave. Lindsey Graham comes back and starts screaming. And then the rest of the Republicans start screaming. And then Brett Kavanaugh starts screaming. And that's how it all yeah. happened, folks, just screaming. So when are the Democrats going to get in the game and get in the trench? I was joking on Twitter yesterday I would pay good money for Judge Jackson to have just said to Ted Cruz, you should have been expelled from the Senate last year for inciting an insurrection. I'm not taking any of your questions. I'd have paid good money for that. Uh, Mark, let me ask you this. Um, look, the Republicans, they know how to troll us very well. A lot of this stuff, the faux outrage, uh, the hysteria, the shouting, as Ellie put it. But it works, right? We end up talking about them a lot. So let's just not be distracted for a moment. Let me ask you the bigger question about the bigger picture. What did we learn? about Judge Jackson, about her qualifications, about her judicial philosophy over the past 48 hours? Well, one thing we learned is that she has an extraordinarily judicial temperament. Uh, she was able yes. to withstand that repulsive questioning, uh, withstand all of those highly personal attacks on her character, on her record, uh, without breaking a sweat, without collapsing into uh, sobs, as I think I would have under those circumstances. Um, and she m maintained her composure. And if she can do that before the Senate Judiciary Committee, she can definitely do it going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sam Alito or Clarence Thomas. So I think that's a very good sign. But also, you know, she has been really candid about her judicial philosophy. No matter how much Republicans claim otherwise, she has been so transparent about how she approaches cases, about how she uh, interprets the law. And the fact that she won't put a label on it, like originalist or textualist, seems to really bug Republicans. But that's how real judges actually work. That's how they do their jobs. They can't boil down their philosophy to an elevator pitch or a single word. And I think she's done a remarkable job explaining to the country, to all of us, how a judge has to put their head down, use all of these tools, the original public meaning, the text, the values supporting a constitutional provision or a law, and try in their good faith effort to reach the best, most supportable conclusion. That's all you can ask of a judge. And she has shown over yeah. and over again that that is what she does. I thought it was also very clever the way in which yesterday and today she kept reminding these senators as well, Congress writes these laws. This is on you. Uh, I thought that was also a very powerful move. Uh, Lisa, I want to play something that Senator Graham said today. Have a listen. 
I guess here's my point I'm trying to make to the American people and to my Democratic colleagues. I wish you had that same attitude when an African-American conservative is appointed to high office in the judiciary. So what happened with Janice Rogers Brown? In 2003, she was an African-American nominee for the D.C. District Court. Instead of celebrating how far we've come, my Democratic colleagues filibustered her ascension to the D.C. Circuit Court. Because it's well known on our side that we were very much considering her to be the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court. Lisa, you have to admire Lindsey Graham's ability to rewrite history in front of millions of live viewers. He had to go back to 2003 uh, for his example of an African woman conservative, African American woman conservative. And then he claims that we were considering her for the Supreme Court. Last time I checked, Donald Trump got three vacancies and nominated three white people, two of them men. That's absolutely right. Absolutely correct. I think it was just another example of what we have seen over the last three days, which is senators focused on issues or raising issues that had absolutely little to nothing to do with Judge Jackson's qualifications for the position for which she is nominated. And that's because she is unquestionably qualified for this position. And, and there was nothing that they could say or do clearly, as she demonstrated that that would um, squash that that undeniable fact. The fact is, the facts are that she is um, qualified. She served as a district ju court judge. She's appointed to the Court of Appeals last year. She has served yes. as a public defender. She's on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Um, you know, she taught herself talked about um, as a judge the importance of her uh, explaining to individuals before her how she arrives at her decisions um, and that she yes. thought that that was an important part of her practice. And I think you saw that in her answers on the occasions when she had opportunity to actually answer questions about the law. Yes, on the you saw her. <laughs> you saw her um, brilliant mind at work. And I would say her energy and excitement about the law, um, again, on those yes. occasions. Um, during the hearing where she was actually asked about the law and had the occasion to talk about it. So uh, I and think Senator Graham's uh, behavior was just one a part of the series of distractions over the last three weeks. Mark, we heard two Republican U.S. senators yesterday questioning Supreme Court decisions on marriage. Have a listen to Indiana's Mike Braun in an interview with Local News. So you would be okay with the Supreme Court leaving the question of interracial marriage to the states? Yes, I think that that's something that uh, if you're not wanting the Supreme Court to weigh in on issues like that, uh, you're not going to be able to have your cake and eat it, too. I think that's hypocritical about Griswold versus Connecticut. Do well, you, you can think? list a whole host of issues when it comes down to whatever they are. Uh, I'm going to say that they're not going to all make you happy uh, within a given state, but that we're better off having states manifest their points of view rather than homogenizing it across the country as Roe versus Wade did. Braun said he misunderstood the question, though it sounded pretty clear to everyone listening. You also had John Cornyn yesterday questioning the gay marriage decision by the Supreme Court of Burgerfell. Mark, at what point do Democrats say, this is an open goal for us? The opponents are saying they question gay marriage and interracial marriage in 2022. I mean, Democrats should be talking about this all the time because Republicans staged this kind of tactical retreat on marriage equality after the Obergefell decision in 2015. That period is over. For the last several years, especially since Kavanaugh and Barrett joined the Supreme Court, Republicans have been full steam ahead on overturning Obergefell and nullifying same-sex marriage, allowing states to ban it once again. That has been very clear throughout these hearings. We hear people like John talking about how, you know, his goal here is to unravel jurisprudential of all of these decisions, not just Roe, but also Obergefell, also Loving versus yeah. Virginia, which protected interracial marriage, uh, contraception decisions. You know, they all spring from the same constitutional source. And you really can't just take a chip out of that and leave the rest standing.
Um, so I think that the senators yeah. know that Roe is likely going to fall, and they are just taking their next target right now. Ellie, let's listen to a moment from Judge Jackson's opening statement earlier this week. During this hearing, I hope that you will see how much I love our country and the Constitution and the rights that make us free. Ellie, you've written a book on the Constitution. You're pretty critical of it. Do you think Judge Jackson feels like she needs to say she loves the Constitution, no matter how much she might actually feel about it? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I don't think that. No, I, I think she probably likes the Constitution very much, right? There, I think she probably uh, upholds the ideals of the Constitution and is willing to work very hard to make those ideals a reality for all Americans. And most of my criticism in the book about the Constitution is not about the ideals or ideas in the Constitution. It is the lack of those ideas and ideals being applied equally to everybody, even for a day. We haven't lived one day in this country where everybody who was eligible to vote was registered to vote and could vote and have their vote counted. We haven't lived a day. We haven't tried. All right. We haven't even tried giving equal protection of the law yeah. to all people. So I think that what Judge Jackson is going to do over her next two, three, three and a half decades on the Supreme Court is try to make the Constitution real for everybody who's living here. And I think that's that's a great that's a great project. And I wish her well on her journey. We'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Ellie Mistal, Mark Joseph Stern and Lisa Kylar Barrett. Thank you so much. Coming up, Ukrainian officials are calling Russia's invasion a genocide. Why one expert says we need to be careful and mindful in our use of that word. But as we go to break, a new appeal from President Zelensky within the last hour at the start of a new day in Ukraine, as Ukraine officially marks one month since the start of Russia's illegal invasion. The world must stop the war. I thank everyone who acts in support of Ukraine, in support of freedom, but the war continues. The acts of terror against peaceful people go on. One month already. That long. It breaks my heart, hearts of all Ukrainians and every free person on the planet. That's why I ask you to stand against the war. Since the beginning of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the country's president, Vladimir Zelensky, has repeatedly referred to Russia's deadly attacks on Ukrainians as a genocide. On March the 2nd, in a press conference, he said that Russia's actions were genocide and Nazism. On March 9th, after the bombing of a maternity hospital in Mariupol, he said that the attack was conclusive evidence that what is happening is genocide of Ukrainians. On Sunday, that came to a head when he spoke to lawmakers in Israel, where he didn't just call the invasion a genocide, but directly tied it to the Holocaust. Ви пам'ятаєте це і впевнені ніколи не забудете. Але почуєте, що звучить зараз в Москві. Почуєте, як там кажуть знову ці слова. Остаточне рішення, але вже по відношенню, так би мовити, до нас, до українського питання. Though Zelensky is himself Jewish, the comparison was poorly received in Israel. The country's prime minister, Naftali Bennett, said it is forbidden to compare anything to the Holocaust. And Yad Vashem, Israel's national Holocaust memorial, said it condemns this trivialization and distortion of the historical facts of the Holocaust. To be clear, this entire discussion is incredibly thorny, a hugely and understandably emotive issue. The people of Ukraine are suffering through an illegal invasion and brutal occupation. It's understandable that they would refer to it in the starkest possible terms. But genocide does have a very specific legal definition. And even within the category of genocide, the Nazi Holocaust is a very specific and unique genocide. So governments not involved in a brutal war tend to try and be careful when they use the G word, as we saw in Washington, D.C. Just, just this past week. Beyond the Holocaust, 
the United States has concluded that genocide was committed seven times. Today marks the 8th, as I have determined that members of the Burmese military committed genocide and crimes against humanity against Rohingya. That was Secretary of State Antony Blinken at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum on Monday, announcing that the U.S. government finally, belatedly, has officially recognized genocide in Myanmar, five years after the violence there reached its peak in 2017. The atrocities left more than 9,000 Rohingya Muslims dead and about a million more displaced. Though Myanmar is not the first time the U.S. has been hesitant to use the term genocide, Bill Clinton famously didn't call mass killings in Rwanda a genocide when it was happening in 1994, in fear that his administration could be forced into military action to prevent those killings, action he was unwilling to take. Because the crime of genocide comes with certain obligations to stop it under international law. It's also why, when it comes to Russia's war on Ukraine, one expert says the term should be used carefully. Historian Waitman Wade Bourne writes, whether genocide is taking place in Ukraine should not be dismissed as a purely semantic or academic argument over terminology. The manner in which we approach mass atrocities in the current war will have implications for our reaction to genocide both now and in the future. We cannot afford to get this wrong. Joining me now is the writer of that piece, Waitman Wade Bourne. He's a Holocaust and genocide historian and a senior lecturer in history at Northumbria University in Newcastle, England. He's also a U.S. combat veteran who served in Iraq. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. The United States has formally accused Russia of war crimes in Ukraine today. But a lot of Ukrainians, including guests on this show, not just their president, have used the term genocide to describe what's going on. In your view, that's not a fair description of what is happening. Why? Well, first of all, Mehdi, thanks so much for having me. Um, and I want to start, before I say anything else about this particular topic, um, by suggesting strongly that um, saying that we're not experiencing or Ukraine is not experiencing a genocide at this particular moment in time is not to minimize the very real suffering yes. that's going on there. The very real war crimes uh, that we just today had confirmation, at least from Secretary of State Blinken, that war crimes have taken place. So I want to begin with that preface. Um, but I also think it's important that we recognize that the word genocide has a legal definition um, and that some of the key components simply are not, um, are not present at the moment. Uh, it's not to say that uh, Russia may not intend something in the future that, that might meet those criteria. Um, but it's not something that we've seen at the moment. So you say in your Washington Post piece that it's so important to get this right, not to get it wrong. Why? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is we need to ensure that we don't cheapen the phrase, that the phrase itself doesn't lose meaning. Um, and we've already seen some of the danger of that with Putin himself making this ridiculous claim that there is a genocide carried out by the Ukrainians. Yes. Right. So already there's sort of the word is, is being thrown around in ways that's not helpful. Um, but if it becomes something that the world sees and other nations see as simply sort of a pejorative term that can be used to smear an opponent, either unintentionally or intentionally, um, I think it then loses the, the sort of um, the magnitude that so we see that the term has. On that note, has it already lost that usefulness? Has it already become politicized? I wonder, has it become like terrorism, something we just apply to what our enemies are doing? We are never the terrorists. Our opponents are the terrorists. Zelensky says the Russians are committing genocide. And as you mentioned, Putin ludicrously says, no, Ukraine is committing genocide against ethnic Russians uh, in Donbass. The US would never agree with anyone who said that the invasion of Iraq was genocide or Israel's crimes against the Palestinians or Saudi Arabia's siege of Yemen. So how helpful or neutral a term is it these days? Well, I think you bring up a great point, uh, which is that, that certainly um, you can find people employing the term genocide um, that runs across the spectrum from judicious to the ludicrous. Um, however, I still think, you know, it, it does have meaning. It does have a legal definition um, from, what the, is, from the... What is that definition? Wait, just remind our viewers briefly, what is the key to that definition? The key is... Um, acts committed with intent to destroy, uh, in whole or in part, a group of people based on national, ethnic, racial, or religious um, criteria. And then there is a okay. list of, of, of other sort of uh, actions that fall under that category. But that's sort of the basic definition. And 
Mike Pompeo, on his last day, one of his last days as Secretary of State, he had the U.S. State Department declare that the Chinese government's repression of its Uyghur minority is genocide. Do you agree with that view? And why do you think he did it on his way out the door? Uh, to be clear, I, th this is not my area of expertise, the, the Uyghur uh, situation in general. Um, I know that there was a group of um, legal experts that were convened within the State Department to come up with that decision. Um, I'm not in a good position to comment on whether or not I think that that's an accurate depiction. I think one of the things that we see in Ukraine, for example, is um, a blurring of the lines between things like crimes against humanity, war crimes, yeah. and genocide. And I think that's where we get some of the, in, in the Ukrainian scenario, where we get some of the, um, the ambiguity with the usage of the term. One last question before I let you go. Were you surprised at the backlash in Israel against Zelensky, a Jewish president, when he made the Holocaust comparison? Because he'd already been making the genocide point. And then he said, well, this is our this final solution is happening to us, too. And there was a backlash. Uh, I, I'm not surprised. I, I do disagree with the, with the comment that it it's, it's, it's forbidden to compare things with the Holocaust. Uh, you know, we have an entire field called comparative genocide where we do exactly that. And as you pointed out in the beginning of your segment, you know, all genocides are unique in their own ways. Um, but I think engaging in sort of the suffering of Olympics, um, yes. the Olympics of suffering rather, is not a, not a helpful um, endeavor. Uh, you know, I, I understand the, the sort of the anger, I suppose, in the use of the term final yes. solution in an area where we're not actually seeing that taking place. What we're seeing is indiscriminate killing of civilians, targeting of civilians. Um, and but that's it has what makes... And now that's what makes everyone so emotional, as you pointed out. Whatever we call it, it's horrible what's going on. We'll have to leave it there. Waitman, Wade Bourne, thank you so much for your time and analysis. Appreciate it. Before we go tonight, I want to offer my commiseration to Republican Congressman Mo Brooks. You know Alabama Congressman Mo Brooks, right? The man who time and time again tried to ingratiate himself with Donald Trump by trying to delegitimize the 2020 election result every chance he could. The guy who on January the 6th told a crowd to start taking down names and kicking ass before that same crowd mobbed and attacked the Capitol. To hear Brooks tell it, he gave that speech because the White House asked him to. He'll do anything for Donald. A speech, by the way, that got him sued by Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell. But at least a congressman's loyalty to Trump and his election lies gave him a chance in his bid for a vacant Senate seat in Alabama. He even touted his priceless Trump endorsement on his Twitter bio, at least until this morning, because despite everything Brooks did to demonstrate fealty to Trump, he found himself having to change that Twitter bio today. In a statement, Trump rescinded his endorsement of Brooks, saying he's gone woke by daring to suggest last summer that voters should put the 2020 election behind them. In fact, Brooks says Trump asked him to rescind the election result, which the congressman himself admits would have been unconstitutional. Hey, Merrick Garland, are you listening? By the way, woke, woke, there is a ton of ways to describe far-right Republican Mo Brooks, but woke ain't it. In his own statement, Brooks blamed Mitch McConnell for manipulating the former president against him. Even now, so loyal to Trump, he also spoke to NBC's Vaughn Hilliard about all this. When you're in Trump world, you come to expect the unexpected. He did not inform me in person for uh, whatever reason. Personally, if I was doing this to somebody, reneging on a commitment, I would have called them and give them a heads up. But no, Donald Trump did not do that. Brooks has been well and truly screwed over by the Donald. Like many, many others before him, this particular Trump sycophant is learning that most obvious of lessons. When it comes to Donald Trump, loyalty is a one-way street. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. I'll see you back here tomorrow night on the TV, 7 p.m. Eastern, live right here on The Choice from MSNBC. And I leave you with this. <laughs> In the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, residents pulling together, laying barricades against the Russian military, while a young man drums out to Bon Jovi's It's My Life. And another moment of hope and inspiration. Amid the devastation in Ukraine, a cellist plays Bach surrounded by ruins in the streets of his native Kharkiv. Good night.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.